But hurry, because Lobster Fest disappears this Sunday. We're making it this easy. We're doubling the factory rebate. Doubling the factory rebate plus $200 at Nick Abraham Buick Chrysler Plymouth. 480 or 90 to Route 57. Cosby star Keisha Knight Pulliam, tonight at 7.30 on TV8. Good evening. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. The American flag was raised today over two Kuwaiti tankers near the mouth of the Persian Gulf. The U.S. Navy is set to escort them through the war zone. This is part of President Reagan's high stakes, high risk, he says, necessary gamble in the Near East. Alan Pizzi begins our report from the scene. With flags flying, American captains on board, and the U.S. Navy shielding them, the tankers were in the final stages of preparation for the two-and-a-half-day run to Kuwait. Naval escort ships shuttled among the tankers today as the convoy formed up. The warships will virtually blanket the tankers on the first leg through the narrow Strait of Hormuz, past Iran's silkworm missiles. Just outside the Gulf, the Navy was taking no chances today. The convoy is the culmination of a major American effort to counter the Soviet presence in the Gulf and convince Arab states that Washington is a reliable ally, in spite of the arms to Iran scandal. Western diplomats here say it's no coincidence that the operation is starting after yesterday's United Nations resolution calling for a ceasefire in the Gulf War. The resolution could give the convoy an excuse to shoot back and help deflect charges of American provocation in the Gulf. Uh, we've tried to make clear that what we're doing uh, is defensive, it is deterrent, uh, it's not provocative. Iran, however, is not happy. If by any chance any uh, target is recognized as legitimate by the Islamic Republic of Iran, we will definitely attack that, that target regardless of whose flag that target is carrying. The U.S. Navy guns will be aimed at Iran's missiles and suicide squads in speedboats. The Iranians have consistently been cast as the villains in American eyes, but there is also a message for Iraq. The Iraqis started the Gulf War. They initiated the tanker attacks and have hit the most ships in an effort to cut Iran's only oil export route. The lone American casualty, the frigate Stark, was the victim of Iraqi, not Iranian missiles. The hope now is that Iraq won't be eager to break the UN ceasefire call its Arab friends backed. Western diplomats here feel the convoy may well have a smooth run through the Gulf this time, but any sense of security from that would be false. Tonight, the Navy was anything but complacent. This is U.S. Navy warship. Do not approach inside 3,000 yards over. The Navy won't say when the ships will head for Kuwait, but most tankers making the run start out under cover of darkness. Alan Pizzi, CBS News, Kuwait. When U.S. warships escort those two tankers into the Persian Gulf, they will be supplied with oil from Kuwait and air cover from an AWACS radar plane based in Saudi Arabia. That's the closest the Persian Gulf states have ever come to supporting the U.S. against Iran. To be seen to be supporting us too much, especially given our record of uh, questionable reliability, is to take a great risk that you're going to be left standing all alone, uh, having supported the great Satan. And so there are real political dangers associated with uh, getting too close to us and allowing us permanent basing. The closest permanent base is nearly 3,000 miles away on Diego Garcia, because none of the Persian Gulf states will permit that kind of U.S. military presence on their territory. If there is a hidden agenda to this escort operation, it is the Pentagon's desire to establish American bases inside the Persian Gulf. Without them, the U.S. cannot defend the oil fields against the ultimate worst case of a Soviet invasion. If we don't get them in time, we can't deploy the air and ground forces. And if we can't deploy the air and ground forces, the Soviets are going to have more or less of a free ride. That's the problem, and I don't think that the countries of the area have faced up to it yet. It's our policy. It's been our policy since our independence. We do not encourage foreign bases in our area. And we still do not encourage that. We would like to see the Gulf free from any foreign bases period. If the escort operation deteriorates into a conflict with Iran, the Arabs may change their mind and the U.S. military could get the bases it longs for in the Persian Gulf, but at a price it does not want to pay. David Martin, CBS News, the Pentagon. Admiral John Poindexter ended his testimony before congressional investigators today. While the Admiral answered some big questions, he ducked some others and often said he couldn't remember. As Phil Jones reports, the last session ended with a bang. Whether or not 
After five days of repeated grilling of Rear Admiral John Poindexter and Poindexter's inability to recall several crucial events, Poindexter's lawyer exploded today when one member suggested that the Rear Admiral had been coached in his testimony. I have not coached my witness, and I'm not going to tolerate that kind of an accusation. Well, Senator now Sarbanes. counsel, now my, counsel my, is down no, there. No, I'm going to finish. My counsel witness is down answering there his questions. answering questions I, directly. I am, I am not going to accept counsel, your characterization counsel, right. that I have coached my witness. On his last day in the hot seat, Poindexter turned up the heat on the next witness, Secretary of State George Shultz, who chose not to fight the Iranian arms sales, even though he was opposed to the policy. He also told you, did he not, though, that he didn't really want to know the details? He, at one point, he did tell me that. The fact is, the sad fact is, the Secretary of State chose to protect his own position, did he not? Uh, uh, you could draw that conclusion. Throughout his testimony, Poindexter has maintained that he never discussed the Contra diversion with then-CIA Director William Casey. Today, some questioners were clearly having trouble accepting the Rear Admiral's claim that this never came up during a private luncheon he had with Casey last November as the scandal was erupting. The only thing that I can be positive of is that there was no discussion of the transfer of funds to the Contras. Well, why don't you tell us what you're not quite positive of but think that you recall? I've told you that. So I don't. That's have all any, you can recall. That's all I can recall. You didn't uh, talk about the um, destruction of documents. No, I do not recall. Would that. you have remembered? Would you remember that now if you had? You believe? Oh, or are I'm you just sure. saying you can't recall one? No, no, no. I, I'm sure this was an enormously important meeting with you and Director Casey, and yet you seem to not recall anything about it except that you had sandwiches. Many members have accepted Poindexter's claim that he did not tell the president about the diversion, but his unrelenting attitude on secrecy had a profound impact on all members. You compartmentalize not only the president's senior advisors, but in effect, you locked the president himself out of the process. I leave this hearing uh, with my head held high that, that I have done my very best uh, to promote the long-term national security interests of the United States. With an embrace from his wife, Poindexter departed to await his next problem, the independent counsel who has targeted him for possible criminal wrongdoing. Phil Jones, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Central American-style death squad attacks on civilians. That's not supposed to happen in this country. But tomorrow, Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley is expected to announce a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of individuals responsible for a series of apparent death squad-style incidents. The alleged targets of the terrorists? Politically active Salvadoran immigrants. David Dow has been asking police about this. In a city of 300,000 Salvadoran immigrants, it raises frightening echoes of the war they fled. A woman active in Salvadoran human rights work is kidnapped from this Hollywood bus stop by two armed men with Salvadoran accents. Released uninjured four hours later, she described through an interpreter her kidnappers' demands. What they wanted to make sure was that the rest of us Central Americans would not collaborate or to work with uh, the Salvadorans. It was the second such kidnapping reported in the Central American community in less than two weeks. This Salvadoran woman says she was raped and tortured, then released with a message. We're going to leave her alive. So with, the, with that, we're going to let them know that we're here. We think that those people, they were members of the death squad or the National Guard or the National Police. Right-wing paramilitary death squads are blamed for thousands of deaths in the Salvadoran Civil War. So far, there is no proof they are also responsible for the Los Angeles incidents. But there appears at least to be a calculated effort to play on their image. We are uh, not uh, discounting uh, the information about uh, uh, political terrorists or death squads being involved. We're viewing them as, uh, as leads and we're treating it uh, very seriously. Besides the kidnappings, there have been two threatening letters, one containing a death list of 19 Salvadoran rights activists, another to a local priest, signed EM, the Spanish abbreviation for death squads. And there has been a series of threatening phone calls, one recorded on an answering machine. We're going to kill you, communist. We're going to kill you, the message says. Such incidents have struck fear among refugees. Some wonder if the war has now followed them north. 
This is United States. This is not El Salvador. Did you stay up there? Not over here. A statement echoed in every Salvadoran neighborhood. David Dow, CBS News, Los Angeles. And still to come on tonight's CBS Evening News, a report on the growing reluctance of dentists to treat patients with AIDS. And correspondent Charles Osgood reports on the growing hopes mm -hmm. for helping hands from a surprising source. <laughs> Come back to Sears. Oh, oh, I think you wanted that one. And it's a beautiful bottle. But if you ever decide to return something to Sears, you don't have to give us a lengthy explanation. Oh, I understand. Don't worry, we'll take care of it. All you have to say is you're not satisfied. In some cases, you don't even have to say that. Just a sprinkle a day, helps the butter away. Shower to shower regular, spice and morning fresh help you keep that just showered feeling from one shower to the next. Have you had a sprinkle today? I never knew raising two kids could be so back-breaking. That's why I take Metaprin. Metaprin has the same medicine as Motrin, and nothing's proven faster for relief of any kind of pain. I haven't got time for the pain. Metaprin, for fast relief. The United States Senate passed a major trade protection bill tonight in spite of President Reagan's threat to veto it. CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer is on Capitol Hill. Bob? Dan, uh, this bill passes after three weeks of debate. It's gone virtually unnoticed outside Washington because of the Iran-Contra hearings being at center stage. Unnoticed, even though people on both sides of the issues have said it will affect thousands of American jobs and hundreds of products. The primary purpose of this trade legislation is to try to help this country become more competitive and better able to sell American-made goods both here domestically and abroad. But how to do that is the question, and the Senate prescription is now more than a thousand pages long, among other things, calling for import curbs to help endangered companies become more competitive. Tariffs and other strong retaliatory measures when foreign governments engage in unfair trade practices. Repeal of the windfall profits tax on oil to reduce dependence on foreign oil. Advance 60-day notification to workers if plants are to be shut down. The White House and many Republicans say the bill is so strong it would set off a trade war with America's allies. The bill is just plain old-fashioned protectionism and unfortunately it is likely to have the same old-fashioned effect that protectionism always has. Democrats counter the strong medicine is needed. 